Today, over 7 billion people experience the world in different ways. Isn't it time for you to think global? Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Think Global podcast. I am your host, International Seth, and today's date is November 21st. You know, ladies and gentlemen, we try to bring on the most fantastic guests all around the world, bringing you real insight and real experiences, and we try to bring these experiences to life. Our goal is to try to show how interconnected we are globally. And we're just going to do that with my special guest today, Neil Doherty. Welcome on the Think Global podcast, Neil. It's good to see you again, brother. Uh, assalamu alaikum. Good to see you. Walaikum <laughs> assalam. Thank you. <laughs> you know, Neil, I, the last time I think I saw you, we, we were actually in Taiwan. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. It must so. be probably seven years ago, six yeah, or six, six or ago. seven years ago. It's hard to yeah. tell because the time is all mumble jumbled now. But yeah, it's good to see you. And thank you for coming on the show, man. Good to see you too, man. Thanks. So I'm just going to put you on the spot right away. Um, we have a segment on our show um, that we, we provide for all of our guests. It's called World Call. And it is when we give our guests 10 seconds to name off some of the countries you've been to. Now, I really know for you, you are a world traveler, um, and we're going to get into all the places you travel to in a little bit. But, um, you know, we just tried to show and try, try to show contracts for people who are interested in traveling, like where were some people would go. OK, so we're going to give you 10 seconds and we're going to put you on the world call. Ready? Go. Russia, Mongolia, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, uh, South Sudan, Somalia. Uh, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Finland, uh, Argentina, wow. Colombia. Wow, 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 wow. All over the world. So we're not, he did not disappoint. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest is Mr. Neil Doherty, and we are going to get into the discussion of travel, particularly when did you start traveling? Like what? Because I know I know you, right? And a little bit about you. I know that you have traveled like off the beaten road. You know, you're not just going to all the holiday and tourist destinations. So what 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 had you been motivation behind by traveling? For my entire life, it's always been all about off the beaten path. Growing up in Colorado, it was, you know, traveling deeper into the back country, taking the Jeep roads less traveled. And I think that that kept going as I started to experience the world. I, I fell in love with off the beaten path international travel the first time I visited Europe. I was maybe 21, 22 years old doing the summer backpacking scene. You know, I think most of us go through that as a, as a doorway into deeper travel. And about halfway through my guidebook summer, I decided to ditch the guidebook this was around the year 2000. Eastern Europe hadn't really been open for more than a decade, okay. uh, you know, post-communism, post-Iron Curtain. And so I had been in Switzerland for a week and thought, this, I'm bored. I'm just bored. And so I got on a train and traveled for 48 hours to Romania. And that was history, man. For the next 20 years, I fell in love with Off the Beaten Path and... Here I stand 97 countries later, and I still prefer the deeper, the better. 97 countries, my goodness. And so I'm about half of you and like, you know, I've, I feel like really, really well traveled and have a lot of awesome experiences. So I can only imagine some of the things that you tried. 97 countries, wow, that's just amazing, man. So by, by background, you were, correct me if I'm wrong, um, you have a, a, a law degree? Yeah, that's right. In 2006, I graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with a law degree and practiced for eight years, um, both in the States and for a short time in Singapore before transitioning to teaching, which has been, uh, let me put it this way, Yusuf. Ten-year-olds are much easier to deal with than legal clients. Wow. <laughs> you know, because when, when we were in class and you, you know, we were introducing each uh, ourselves and, you know, you had mentioned that my jaw just kind of dropped. I was like, 
Wow. You know, I mean, this was like one of the best things for me to, uh, you know, be able to 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 attend the TCNJ graduate program because I've learned so much just from my colleagues. You know, the professors and teachers were great. We learned a lot. But just learning for your guys stuff like that, with your your experience coming from a law degree and I'm like trying to become a teacher. I'm like, wow, you know, I just really like to keep my ears open. So let's talk a little bit about that, that that transformation from background and uh as an attorney and then into um international teacher yeah i think i slowly i think i slowly started backing away from the practice of law the day i started doing it Mm -hmm. the education aspect of law was extraordinary i wouldn't take law school back for anything Mm -hmm. those three years the depth of critical thought and writing expertise it gave me research ability it's a lifetime of benefit, but I think the legal practice isn't, it's not what I thought it would be. Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't like what seemed, it seemed like many senseless hours spent on, on senseless things. I don't know how else to put it. And I'm sure I'm offending people out there, but that's my, that's my truth about it. I didn't feel a connection to the clients. I didn't feel a connection to the work. And so I think it was a seven or eight year extraction process. That's hard when you put your time and effort into a degree, into a process, into a profession to say, okay, I need to come out of it. This isn't who I am. Mm. So it it took nearly a decade, but I'm very thankful that um, I found international teaching. My wife got a job at Singapore American School in 2013. I went as a lawyer and very quickly realized A, this, I, I, I became more closely connected to her teaching, saw what she did, fell in love with it. Life-changing. This is what I want to do. I want to do it right away. So within six months, I had closed the legal business that I had opened mm-hmm. and was working as a teaching assistant at Singapore American School mm-hmm. and traveling to and from TC and J classes every few months. It's been wonderful, and I don't look back on it for a moment, missing the legal aspect. Man, that's awesome, man! And credit to you, man! Credit to you because it's you know it's it's difficult to like do things or have a career where you really don't feel passionate about. You know, they say like when I was playing basketball, they said um, it doesn't feel like work because it's something that you love to do, right? So right. Uh, when you have such a passion for teaching and you're in the classroom, you have all these energetic kids coming at you with just trying to learn. And obviously it adds another element when you're in a foreign environment, right? Because it's always interesting. It's always new. Uh, you're learning things about their culture. So just credit to you, man. Well done, man. And I'm, I'm sure the kids who are, um, who, who, who are learning under you are really appreciative of, of it as well. Yeah, thanks so much. I, I've been so happy. And the, what you mentioned about international teaching being more multidimensional, adding cultural aspects into a classroom, as you know, is, it's pretty extraordinary, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, how, you, how you're going to celebrate student A's birthday is vastly different from how you're going to celebrate student B's birthday. And you really have to be up on, on the holidays of your cultural surroundings. How am I going to respect and embrace you know, this kid's special day, this kid's special day. I think there's so much that goes into it. It's a really beautiful part of international teaching. Awesome, man. And again, credit to you, man. So let's talk about some of your travels now because we want to hear about some of these 97 countries and the stories behind it. I know one thing you told me before also that you the more you traveled, um, the more you wanted to try to catch these um, experiences. And one method that you have done that, one medium that you have done that is to the art of photography. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. I, I, I want to take one quick step back. My, my passion for travel really developed alongside my wife's. And okay. that's something amazing that we shared early in our relationship. And we got off the beaten path together. We would go again uh, to Colombia, for example, not long after it became safer again, after you know the civil war and, and the, the narco stuff that went on in, in Colombia, sadly, for so many years. And we'd get to these places and we'd meet the most extraordinary people and have these experiences, these cultural experiences that I wanted to share more deeply 
than just a phone call to, to a relative. And um, that's where the camera can I it became a way to share, as you have probably seen, most of my photographs are of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have all the respect in the world for landscape photographers, fashion photographers. For me, it's all about street photography, right? Because you're telling a really honest story. You're capturing a moment in time. And it's not just a, a one-sided story. It's a two-way conversation. I'm saying something through my lens and that person is communicating back to me through the same lens. It's, to me, it's no different than having a conversation like we're having, only you're doing it through a camera. Uh, the interactions through that lens, through that, that moment in time, the decisive moment as it's called in photography, they're extraordinary conversations and I think they've enriched me very well, That's deeply. great, so let's get into it because I'm right. sure our audience is gonna enjoy these photos right here. So let me put up the photo number one and, uh this is uh, a photo that you have, and I see a guy um, smoking a cigarette. Um, well, hopefully it's a cigarette. We don't know for sure, but uh, <laughs> uh, let's 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 hear her have it. So let's let's can you can you tell the story about behind, behind this one? Yeah, for sure. My wife and I were living in uh, in Singapore at the time, and we would take uh, three day, four day weekend trips around the region, even two day weekends, we would get in an airplane and just explore, explore. And one of the places we, we had heard so many wonderful things about was Bangladesh. Okay. Um, and, you know, for those in the audience who have heard of Bangladesh, but aren't exactly sure it's, it's just east of India. It's wedged between India and Myanmar. It's, it's kind of like a bridge between South Asia and Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And there are cultural elements of both, although it's, it's much more closely connected to the Indian subcontinent. And that's the first place where I really had a, what I call a grown-up camera, you know, a DSLR, a proper lens. I had done my homework. I knew what I wanted to shoot. And that picture of the man smoking is, is the first time I had sat down and communicated with someone uh, that I stopped seeing a camera as the one-sided a one-sided, um, you know, way to glorify my travels and instead started looking at the camera as a way to communicate. And I kneeled down in front of him in a market and brought the camera up and it gave me chills. It still gives me chills thinking about everything we said to each other in that moment without using words. Wow. And that was it. So I always include that photograph in any collection because to me, it was the birth of really a new, a new way of conversing with people and a new way of communicating with, with the world. Wow. That's, that's, that's really deep, really deep, really deep, man. Whew. <laughs> that gave me shivers just thinking about it. I mean, profound, very profound, but this next photo, I mean, this is like, when I look at this, I mean, uh, it could be, I really don't know just by the look at it, this photo, I see a kid standing on what appears to be a tank. I don't know what country it is, but I mean, this, the contrast between the youth and this, this large, um, you know, weapon of mass destruction, um, it, it should, should definitely tell a deeper story as well. What can you, can you talk about this story? Yeah. So if, if Southeast Asia, if South Asia and Southeast Asia have my soul, which they do, man, my spirit just permanently resides in, in that part of the world. My heart resides in this part of the Middle East. This is Northern Iraq, the Kurdish region of Iraq. I've made two trips to Iraq over the past five years. Uh, one trip to the North, uh, Kurdistan, and one trip to the South, uh, the Holy Centers, the Shia Centers in Southern Iraq, Najaf, Karbala, uh, Basra. This is a picture in Kurdistan. This is a Kurdish boy outside the uh, Kurdish region's capital of Erbil. And in the early 90s, I wanna say, just after the Gulf War, Saddam was still in power and Saddam sent some tanks into the Kurdish region to do what Saddam did best, oppress, suppress, and um, you know, tried to wipe the Kurds off the map, essentially, a really tragic time in their history. But don't mess with the Kurds. I don't know what 
what you know about them, if you've studied them, if you know any, the Kurds are some of the toughest folks on earth and I admire them greatly. And they, they stopped him. They stopped Saddam's army. They stopped the advance, not without losses, but they stopped them. And this tank was left and they leave it there to this day. So Kurdish people can go and remember and talk to, to this generation and future generations about the struggle they went through for, you know, their own autonomy, their own, their own freedom in a sense. And I loved this boy was visiting with his family. It was a, it was a Saturday afternoon, a weekend afternoon, and they had stopped for a visit at the same time I did dressed up, you know, vest on the family had suit tie. It was an event for them, an important event. And so I, I just thought this story told, or this photo told the story of that cultural struggle and the cultural pride very well. Whew, man. Well, all right. So let me put this in a little bit of context because we have a wide audience of people, right? So you're always talking about Iraq and I played in Kuwait. So Kuwait obviously borders Iraq. And whenever yeah. I was, you know, uh, back home and people were saying, where are you playing this year? Or what are you up to? Do you know, I'm saying, yeah, I'm playing in Kuwait. And their eyes go big, like, oh, my, you're doing what? Like, how, how is it? It's dangerous. I'm like, God, you don't have stuff falling on you and bombs blowing up and stuff. But, you know, actually, Iraq was, you know, very turbulent, probably around that same time that you that you went to. So, I mean, how I'm, I'm sure there's not a lot of tourists in Iraq. Um I could be wrong, but, you know, but uh, so how, how, how do you navigate this? Like uh, visas and like, you know, do you have a tour guide or like, where do you stay? You know, like, how do you, how, you know, are you worried about your safety? Yeah, I think that's a, a very important question. And anytime I, I talk about places like Iraq, I like to include this conversation because I, I would never, I would never suggest someone just, says at the drop of a hat, okay, I've been to a few countries. I, I've traveled once or twice. Let's go to Southern Iraq, for example. I think that the important thing to remember is that warfare doesn't engulf, often doesn't engulf an entire country. And indeed that was the case um, during much of the 2000s, the 2010s, 2010s in Iraq. It didn't engulf the whole country. You know, there was a lot of trouble northwest of Baghdad, the Sunni Triangle. But much of the country was without conflict during that time. And I think that you really have to be plugged in with a local. This is my second point. Like, have knowledge, A, and get that knowledge from local sources. Mm. It's vital. Like, having that line of communication open. So I worked with a guy named Adam Jabreen, and Adam is an Iraqi by birth. He lives in Great Britain now, but, but takes people into Iraq. Um, he has a great company. And so we, we communicated. I understood the situation on the ground down south. It seemed safe to go in. And so we spent, uh, my wife and I, I spent five days there, and it was an absolute delight. You would never think it was a country of conflict in the north and he arranged all the visas in the north you can fly into kurdistan the kurdish region of iraq visa free you just get a passport stamp on arrival as an american most european countries we can come in visa free but you cannot leave the kurdish region mm. right you can't go into it, iraq proper the kurdish have kind of an autonomous region it's not a country up there um they did try to gain independence for a period but it has autonomy including um, immigration autonomy at the border. But I, I can't stress enough, having local connections and local knowledge and local language has to drive your decision making in countries that have the threat of conflict. Hey, sounds sounds pretty crystal clear to me. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, yep. Yep. Sounds crystal clear to me. Yeah, that's very, very good advice and solid advice. Wow. Okay. So we continue on this journey. We're going to probably get a little bit of, so we had uh, Southeast Asia, the Middle East. Let's yeah. go to your, your, your journeys in Africa. So um, this next picture I'm going to put up is, uh, looks like a boy, a uh, young man uh, holding a, 
a bushel of some kind of uh, plants or something. Uh, can you explain what this picture was and where did you take it? Yeah, so again, as the progression goes, my soul is in Southeast Asia. My heart is in the Northern Middle East, uh, Lebanon, Iraq. I mean, these are just really passionate, incredible places. My mind, my mind loves Africa. I could study Africa until the day I die. I could read every book, digest every map. And one of the places that had fascinated me for so many years was Somalia. And Somalia, you know, we, we've seen in movies and popular culture, we've seen Somalia really glorified as just a permanent war zone, a failed mm -hmm. state, a war zone. I don't want to take away from those analyses. There's been plenty of warfare there. There are warlords there. Has the government failed in some respects? Absolutely. But what Somalia is, it's three, it's it's almost three separate countries. There's Somalia proper, there's Puntland to the north of, of uh, Mogadishu. And then as Somalia hooks around, right, it's, it's kind of shaped like a, a seven. Mm -hmm. And in the cross part of that seven, there's an area called Somaliland. Mm -hmm. Somaliland is self-governing. It's not recognized by the international community or any other countries, to my knowledge, as an independent country. Mm -hmm. But in all other regards, it is an independent country. It has its own currency. It has its own um, customs, immigration, head of government, head of state. It acts as uh, an independent nation would act. And mm -hmm. so I've just been fascinated by the Somalia that we can actually see outside of pop culture. So living in Ethiopia over the past few years, we had a free weekend and took the 45, 50 minute to Hargeisa, Somaliland, the kids, my wife, me, and had just an extraordinary two days learning about this part of Somali culture. And there's a market in the middle of Hargeisa, the capital. Uh, and dude, it is, have you seen Star Wars? Yeah, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a star, a star with uh, Star Wars, uh, fan to be honest but yeah all good all good you don't need to be it was like being in that market was like the scene in the original star wars on tatooine when they're at the the moss Eisley spaceport and there are all of these colors and modes of dressing that are unfamiliar and appearances that are unfamiliar and sounds that are unfamiliar but you know that they're just extraordinary and rich and i started seeing these cot these cot dealers, uh, as you probably know, living in the Middle East, cot is a, a popular, uh, it's a, I don't want to, I hate to call it a drug. Yeah. It, I mean, that's what it's, it acts as a drug. You chew yeah. on it. And I mean, um, some kind of stimulant or, you know, yeah. like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a stimulant. And these, these cot shipments would come in mid afternoon when the market was closed. And then the market would open when the heat of the day subsided mm -hmm. and the cot stalls were just open and man, they were flooded with locals. And I said, I, I have to shoot one of these guys. Mm -hmm. And of course they were naturally very adverse. They did not want to be photographed. Mm -hmm. I, I was not trusted, but this is where that local knowledge and local language comes in. I just kept, and you have to have a certain amount of confidence as well right? Approach these guys, speak to them in, in Arabic. Mm -hmm. Make sure they understand that you want to have a conversation. You're not there to exploit them. You're not there to, to, to treat them like they're in a zoo. You're there mm -hmm. to talk to them. You're there to tell their story. And I think once you're clear that you're telling someone's story and conversing with them and sharing them with, with the world, they loosen up quickly put yourself on the same plane as someone else, have empathy. And this guy loved it. You know, we, we started talking about life in Arabic and soon enough, I was able to shoot him. And it was really a dream come true to get the shot. Uh, it's a shot that I had, I had wanted to get for months, if not years in Somalia. That's interesting. You said that cause I had a similar experience when we went to, um, East, Eastern uh, Ethiopian, Harar. Yes. 
Yeah, so we, we stayed a very, very remote place in, uh, in Ethiopia, all the way in, in the east, and it's actually in UNESCO Heritage uh, uh, City, but uh, the same type of experience where, like, the, the cat is the, is, the, is the thing of the, of the whole entire market, right? Like, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 the, it's, the, it's the cream of the crop, so they say, you know, and, you know, so everybody's, you know, the whole, you know, like the economy, it all revolves kind of around this, you know, like, I just, when you said that, it, the, 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 the shipment came in at, you know, in, in the afternoon, I just really visualized that because I, I experienced the same thing in Harar. You know, in, in Addis, where we used to live, Addis Ababa, the capital in Ethiopia, they used to brag if they had, if a, I used to go down to the market in Addis Ababa too and, and photograph. And uh, I loved that in Ethiopia, it's, it's pronounced chat, as you correctly noted. I'd go down and talk to the chat dealers and man, they would brag if they had chat from Harar, they, they, I mean, that was it. There is no finer thing in that entire market. So hurrah. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a really funny story too. I mean, uh, one of the reasons why this is a UNESCO heritage site because it's it's very diverse and it's a, they they've avoided any like religious confrontations. And so they have mosques and they have uh, churches, like really, really old churches. Um, and apparently um, the the local imam, he has a little, 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 little um a mosque there it's like a i've been to it it probably pits about five or six people all right but he's the the local imam and so he he's they said that he will pray uh, make a special prayer for you if you bring him a kilo of, of chat <laughs> <laughs> but but he doesn't just take any old chat it has to be the premium the high high grade stuff so <laughs> there, there are grades man and, and certainly not that i know personally but the Ethiopians who I know, especially there are grades uh, and they make it clear when it is high grade. Those yeah. guys get, those guys get front row billing at the markets. It's amazing. So let's, let's, let's move on to this next photo. And this is something I could also relate to because I actually spent um, about three weeks in Rwanda and I absolutely loved it. It really, really just like, it was so exciting for me to see an uh, African country like Rwanda doing so well and becoming so vibrant and so progressive. So, I mean, I, I, I've told people like, you lived in Singapore, so it's probably not as to that standard in Singapore. But I, to me, Rwanda was one of the, the cleanest cities, or Kigali. Kigali was one of the cleanest cities I've ever, I've, I've really ever been to, you know, like, Every day, you know, it seemed like the, the president had his, you know, people employing people to take uh, care of the city and to, um, you know, take ownership and pride in the city. And the streets are clean. You don't see garbage. They have something where they have no plastic in the country. You know, you get fined if you have plastic and they have when you go to the supermarket, you check out and they give you like this, like, um, like a paper mesh bag, you know, and I was just like, they're saying, oh, it, it's clean for Africa. I was like, no, it's clean, it's clean, it's clean, it's clean, like Europe, America, it's a clean country. So I see this photo as well. This also looks like uh, some people are having fun. Uh, you want to talk about Rwanda and, you know, and your experiences there? Yeah, man. And that knocked my socks off too. I just, we landed at night, my wife and I, and even at night, the cleanliness of Kigali was something that I had heard about, but didn't expect it to be the extent it was when I saw it. And you're right, not just by African standards, by any, by any standard, that city is, it's not just spotless. It, there's, you, describing it as clean, I don't think goes far enough. There's a, there's a clear pride, yeah. right, that exists, don't you think? Absolutely. Like a, a pride of place like this this is our city and we are going to take care of it and uh it just i feel it everywhere in that city and and so it was it was nice to be there my wife and i liked traveling uh, in african cities um you know there's uh and you've probably seen this i think it's too bad there's this uh, stereotype of africa that you travel there to go see game right that you travel for lions for elephants mm -hmm. for the experiences in the national parks and i don't want to take away from that but i think that unfortunately people miss 
the beating heart of African culture when you just go to game reserves and stay in, in five-star tents, right? There are cities, there are cultures, there are cuisines uh, to be found in Africa that are extraordinary and really unknown for the mm-hmm. traveler. So I encourage your listeners to, to explore these African cities as well. And Kigali is one that so our experience was we spent a day with a, a local photographer named Jack. Mm-hmm. His real name is not something I can pronounce. Mm-hmm. And so he, he goes by Jack. And, and Jack was a photographer in Kigali during the, the war years. Um, and he, the guy has stories that I, I, I admire him deeply. He cataloged that country's struggle through civil war with his camera. He is the true definition of someone who communicates and has conversations with the camera. What he's done for his country is, is extraordinarily important. And uh, he helps run a, a photography center in Kigali now. But we hooked up with him for the day and went street shooting in Kigali during the morning mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, dove deep into to you know, real neighborhoods, went into houses, got to know some great kids, man, some kids running around the streets, played, played a little soccer, but we really hit it off. We connected with Jack and Jack said, well, what are you doing this afternoon? I said, oh, you don't have any plans yet. And he said, I I'm a DJ also. And what I do is I load my gear into a van and I drive out to villages. These villagers never come into the city, right? Mm. Their life is out in their village and they don't get to go to nightclubs. They don't get to go hear the music that's, that's, you know, beating throughout the country, throughout the world. They don't get to hear new tracks. They don't get to, to dance in these, these environments. And so I take it to them and I call them day clubs blew my mind why this isn't happening in the rest of the world maybe it is but why it's not happening more broadly is shocking Mm -hmm. he rolled into this village and it happened to be the village he grew up in about 90 minutes outside of kigali way up in the mountains you'd you would think that uh, justin timberlake himself was rolling out of that van wow i mean they they were cheering they did this traditional local dance it was beautiful welcoming him he set up his his macbook and these big speakers and a mixing board and dude he just blew that place up for two hours amazing Amazing. everyone i mean drunk people were drinking people i mean it was like a nightclub at noon noon. (laughs) i mean that's amazing and and, and, uh, I, i i could just man i could just like yeah, I could just see that scene right there because, uh, yeah, I have some really good experience with, with some Rwandan people as well. Uh, we had a tour guide who took us over to Uganda and we went uh, tr- tracking for the, the gorillas. And he was just, they're so genuine and, you know, they're so at peace. And they are really, because of the history and the, the civil war that happened, uh, they are willing to, you know, just really uh come together as as a country move forward well at least that that's what it seems like obviously there's 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 a lot of history there and it's a it's a process but uh it looks like um they're heading in the direct right direction i really feel like i feel like they're heading in the right direction they're thriving uh you know jack has started a um a photo exhibition in kigali an annual photo exhibition now it's just yeah, it's opened up. It feels fresh. It feels vibrant. And uh, even out in the countryside, I mean, it. I want to stress, this shows the importance of getting in with locals, the importance of locals in these types of travels. Because, I mean, we, we had to hire a taxi van, drive on some highway, some, you know, really lengthy dirt roads for an hour and a half, two hours, just to get out to this place. Mm-hmm. I never would have met these people. Of had course. Not been <laughs> of course. I, like, <laughs> you know, I'm not getting out there. Uh, Google Maps is not going to take you. <laughs> like, yeah, turn right here on this little dirt road. And, <laughs> and what am I going to do when I get there, right? Exactly, exactly, to- exactly. So I um, think, I think I, I, yeah, I've told you this before. Oh, sorry. No, just, just finding that local connection, 
and being open to the experiences, not, not having a set agenda, but understanding that you're in a different culture and that culture is going to turn you and flip you like a wash machine. Right. So just be open, be ready and go local. Really good advice. Go local, go local and think global. Uh, this yeah. is uh, the think global podcast show. Uh, I want to make sure our audience subscribe to our, our show. If you like uh, issues like this, that we're bringing Neil on, uh, you can subscribe to our channel, follow us on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And if you wanted to do some shopping, you can shop at azomco.com. So I'm on the I'm on the line with Mr. Neil Doherty, and we are discussing some really really powerful experience that he has overcome, and we're doing it through the um, the medium of his camera. And so we're putting up photos, and we're bringing you guys into these real experiences. We're on photo number five. And I think I've told you before, we had this discussion. I think I've, I've, I've talked to you about Sudan before. My wife is Sudanese. She grew up in England, but her, her, her parents are Sudanese. And we actually got married in Khartoum. And we got married in 2011 in Khartoum. Oh, and this was, at, as, as you will know, it was the same time when the North and the South split. Yep. So literally, yep. when we were going there, there was these massive trucks, and they had a whole bunch of stuff on there, and lots of people packed down. And I was like, what's going on? What's going on? He said, these are the people who are going back to South Sudan. These are mm -hmm. the people who are, are, are leaving the country and going back home. Um, of course, the promise was like to have pride in their own country, um, but you know, I've, I've, from what I hear, I hear that South Sudan is very underdeveloped, and uh, you know, it just doesn't have the infrastructure or the. I, I know it has a lot of oil just on the uh, on the on the northern border of, of, of South Sudan, but it just doesn't seem like the infrastructure is intact and the economy is intact. And now I heard there's a whole bunch of uh, fashions fighting for power or whatever, but. This um, picture that you have showed, um, I, I, I believe that there is a very authentic story behind this, right? And it's good to it's good to 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 give up everything, right? Because you have we have to be honest. I mean, this is your experience, and we have to be honest with our with with, with our travels. Yeah, the honesty piece is vital. You know, people like people like me, people like my my beautiful wife, Delise people like my kids, um, like-minded individuals, we rely on honesty when traveling. The places we travel to, if you aren't connected with honest people or you're not getting advice from, from honest sources, there's a lot of trouble to be had. Mm -hmm. So you're right. You have to be upfront and honest. So with that as a segue, this, this is the most throwaway picture I've, I've ever shared publicly. There's nothing happening in this picture. We traveled for a short weekend to South Sudan uh, in 2018. As you mentioned, conflict. Uh, there had been an ongoing civil war there between two main factions, the president's faction and um, I, the former vice president's faction had been fighting on and off for a number of years. And uh, it creates, civil war creates, to that degree, creates a lot of distrust um, in the local community. And, uh, one of the ways that that distrust manifested itself was no photography, mm -hmm. right? Uh, cameras were really frowned upon. Why are you here with a camera? This is a conflict zone. What are you taking pictures of? Why are you taking pictures? And I knew this, you know, other travelers, uh, only about 2000 tourists per year, it's estimated visit South Sudan. That's about six, six people per day entering as tourists. Mm. And it's likely less than that. So it, it's, not like, it's not like I'm a, a common sight on the streets mm. of Juba, the capital of South Sudan. It's very unusual to see a, a, a white Western tourist walking down the streets of Juba. So mm -hmm. already suspicious, already a conflict zone. And uh, I was riding with... It was my wife, me, and uh, one of our friends. And we were riding in a white van that we had arranged through our hotel. And I said, can I take photos? And whatever his answer was, it's not important. I don't want to get into to that, <laughs> that conflict that we had. I misunderstood him. He misunderstood me. And I started taking photos out the window of the van. 
And maybe two minutes later, a, an SUV swerved in front of us, uh, pulled our vehicle over, uh, opened the door of the van, took my camera, and it was a local militia. Militias run the streets of Juba, at least they did at the time when we were there. Lots of militias, uh, you know, different sides of the Civil War. Not in uniform, which I don't know if you've ever had this experience, getting stopped by heavily armed men without uniforms on is scary. Anyone who tells you it's not scary is lying to you or has a death wish, man. I don't like no, no uniforms. And so they took the camera, started flipping through it. Lots of questions for the van driver. Long story short, they didn't like any of his answers. Another SUV had pulled up. They took us to a, a local militia tent. My wife and our friend had to stay in the van and I had to go into this tent with about 10 or 12 militia members. And basically it wasn't an interrogation in the sense that I was physically threatened, but it was very, very verbally threatening for about an hour. Um, why are you here? Are you a spy? Are you a member of the army? Why are you taking these pictures? Why are you in our country? And it's a longer story than what we have time for here. Yeah. But I think the takeaway was once again, Yusuf, that local knowledge, you know, being able to talk to them at their level. I'm, I'm their guest, right? I, they're not a zoo. I always say zoo animal. They're not my zoo animals to, to observe through a glass. We're having a two way interaction. Yeah. And they speak this, this really cool Creole Arabic mm -hmm. in in South Sudan. I know a little Arabic. And so I started using the, the small amounts of standard, modern standard Arabic that I knew. Mm -hmm. And it just broke the ice, man. They thought it was so funny listening to this Waraka talk this, you know, what to them is super intellectual Arabic. Yeah, Fusa, no yeah, the classical yeah. Arabic, yeah. Yeah, so they're looking at me like, what? So that broke the ice, broke the ice. They kept asking, are you army? Are you army? And I said, look, man, I can't even do a few push-ups. I'm not army. So using humor, using language, using, you know, humanity. Yeah. Turned a, a situation that could have been really, really dire into yeah. still a scary moment, but one that ultimately had a happy ending. They realized the pictures were nothing. They gave us a, a militia escort back to our hotel and, told us to get square and be safe and put the camera away yeah i mean let's face it if you if they if the, army, the other army wanted to uh send a spy I'm, I'm sure they could send somebody a little bit more discreet than you know like you okay. said a white american guy who can you know it's like if you if they're going to be a little bit more discreet then yeah but i don't know that's an interesting story man and that just shows you like like you said like you know honesty um and uh that local connection and uh but yeah i i like how you how you just kind of you obviously obviously it must have been terrifying you know i mean because you really don't know what's going to happen but it seemed like you dealt with it the correct way by just saying like being real right being real and just kind of not being like because if maybe if they you came at them and you became so defensive and you know you did that you know they might have took that as a different way as well but that's the common thread through all this is, is being real and recognizing that you're a guest and you're, you're on equal footing. We're all humans, all occupying the same planet. You're a guest in someone's culture. You're a guest in their home and act like it. All right, so let's, uh, photo number six, I'm gonna put this photo up right here. And uh, do you wanna who, explain who these lovely people are? It's my family. This is uh, this is taken in uh, Slovakia uh, a few Christmases ago. My wife and I are there, and these are our two kids. Um, this is our daughter Sarah and uh, our son Kellen. They um, are just the most extraordinary people. Uh, everything I have in my life, I, I owe to my wife primarily and my two kids. Our daughter is adopted from the uh, the DRC, Democratic Republic of the Congo. 
and our son was uh, was born and adopted from the kingdom of Lesotho in southern Africa. Wow, that's amazing. So when 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 did you adopt your your, your children? And uh, like, you want to touch a little bit about the process of it, or? Yeah, sure. We adopted Kellen about uh, about ten years ago. Uh, my wife and I went to Lesotho for two weeks. And um, for listeners who are just reading it phonetically, this country looks like it's it's pronounced Lesotho, mm -hmm. uh, but it's pronounced Lesotho. It's it's the little small country in the middle of South Africa, mm -hmm. completely surrounded by South Africa. Uh, and it's an incredible place. The culture, it's way up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a mountainous culture. And so we, we went there in 2000, about 10 years ago, to adopt Kellen, spent two weeks there learning about the culture. Um, again, learning some of the local language and spending those two weeks there with him and surrounded by that, uh, by that culture was a really meaningful time. Mm -hmm. And then in 2013, we adopted Sarah. I was still a lawyer at the time and, and had a, a trial, had a court case. And the judge was not letting me out for any reason. And mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're obligated to go represent your client. So I, I couldn't leave the country. And with adoption, you get the phone call. You have to go, right? It's not, hey, can you wait six weeks? You know, I, I have work. No, you're, first of all, your, your child's in an, an orphanage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, probably not nourished as well as they could be, not receiving the care that, uh, as, as the care to a level that they should be receiving. And so you want to go, you want to go. And so my wife, who is such a brave human, I mean, she is extraordinary, got on a plane and flew to Kinshasa by herself. Wow. And uh, spent some time in Kinshasa adopting Sarah, uh, experiencing the city. And for those of you, uh, whether or not you've been to this part of Central Africa, there is nothing lightweight about the DRC. I haven't been, but from what I understand from my wife and the reputation it has, the DRC is, is heavy hitting for a traveler, for a Western traveler. It is real. There is not a tourism infrastructure it is, you know, legitimate urban Africa, and it looks a lot different than some place than like Kigali, right? Mm -hmm. It's almost like the 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 anti Kigali. Yeah. Well, even when we were in Kigali, they gave us three options. I said, either you, if you want to go visit the gorillas, you can go in up north in Rwanda and pay fifteen hundred dollars for four hours. I was like, whoa, that's kind of see per person. Or you could yeah. go to uh, Uganda. You could play. It was half that price. I think it was like seven hundred dollars in Uganda. Or you could go to the DRC and pay like like two hundred. But you might not come back. So we went with the, with the Uganda route. <laughs> yeah. Happy medium. Yeah, happy medium. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Yeah, so, that's. Uh... That's on the east side of the DRC. That's uh, that's called Virunga National Park. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, most people come in and out of Virunga very safely, but every few years, um, a group might get abducted or a park yeah. ranger might yeah. get shot. Those park yeah. rangers operating in the eastern DRC, they're doing hero's work, man. Yeah. They're protecting gorillas, protecting a national treasure for the DRC mm -hmm. against warlords and poachers. And I, I just... It's impressive work for any of your listeners who want to learn more about it. It's it's worth learning about what those yeah. park rangers are doing. Yeah, because our tour guide said that where that border, where all three of those those countries, the DRC, Rwanda, and Uganda meet, there's a mountain, right? And that was yes. a natural habitat of those gorillas. And based upon where they can go, they can either go to the Rwanda side or the Uganda side or the DRC side. So they were making a joke that saying that once they, one day the gorillas went to the Uganda side and then the park rangers scared them down there to keep them back, go from going back over to the, <laughs> to the other side. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the DRC, I, I feel for them, right? Because this the conflicts in the DRC, 
whether it's warfare or crime, the DRC is a special place. Their cultural traditions, their music tr tradition, man, again, listeners, listen to Congolese music. It's, they have guitar players that are, they're world-class what they're doing. They're, they're, the music that comes out of the, D the DRC is what you think that Central Africa should sound like. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. But, you know, the majority of folks are caught up in conflicts that are perpetuated by a small minority of folks. And it's just a really sad, sad time there. But I look forward to returning with my daughter someday and, and seeing her home. I know, I know, I have faith that in my lifetime, that'll be possible. Man, may God, God make it possible for you guys and have a safe passage back. Now, I know one thing, um, you know, you were talking about how rewarding it was and how important it is for your children to, you know, still be in tune with their, their, um, their heritage. So um, this last picture I'm going to put up. This is Kellen, and this is my, my lovely wife, who, again, she is just, she's selfless, she's brilliant, and she, she put in the time and effort um, over the past year to find Kellen's birth family. Wow. In Lesotho. Amazing. Man, shout connected. out to your wife, man. This is just amazing, man. We we, we should have it. We have you have you guys sit down together. I know she's a she's overseas right now, yeah. Yeah, she's in Ethiopia still. Yeah. Uh, I'm at home for the year with my daughter as she starts high school here in the, in the USA. Uh -huh. My wife is in Ethiopia finishing her contract uh, this year with my son. So just before COVID, man, a few weeks. It, it was in March, right? So mm -hmm. just a few weeks before all the lockdowns started, we we all of her hard work came to fruition and we mm. flew down to Lesotho for a weekend, met an old friend there who's, uh, who's in the social welfare ministry. Um, th this woman who had actually directed, who had run our in-country adoption 10 years ago is now uh, a high ranking bureaucrat in the, in the ministry there in Lesotho. So she had really moved up. Her name is Masha Pane and she helped my wife track down Kellen's family a few hours outside the capital of Maseru in this mountainous village. Dude, it was, it was magical. It wow. was pure magic. Drove up one morning uh, in a pickup truck into this village, just getting further and further off the road, deeper into the mountains. And we brought a bunch of gifts and the whole family was there. You know, sadly, he, he is an orphan because his mother and father were out of the picture, but mm -hmm. his grandmother was there, uh, you know, aunts, uncles, cousins, extended family. As soon as his grandma walked out of this, this home, you knew it was his grandma. Mm. They looked alike, their facial structure, their everything about them, that nature versus nurture, you know, it, it, it showed me how how prevalent nature still is at this day and age. He had been raised by us, but his family connection was clear. And so this photo, you know, this photo is so meaningful to me and our family because it, it was almost as if grandma was passing, you know, passing the family torch to my wife, Felice, bringing her into the family with that, that smile. It was mm. a lot of gratitude, you know, raising raising my my grandchild as one of your own it was a beautiful moment it's it showed me the possibilities of adoption adoption's very contentious it's not without its um its mm -hmm. debates mm -hmm. and i understand both sides of those debates and mm -hmm. you know i can give credit to both but this this is really showing the most beautiful side bringing families together to care for a child and keep the child's best interests in mind man wow Whew, I'm speechless, man. Oh, man, this has been a, a fantastic episode, man. I think this one had been our best episodes, man. Oh, man. So let's try to conclude this, man. And um, is there any final words that you want to say? I mean, I know I know you really touched on the um, the the locality and getting to know uh, local people and um, uh, and all of that. Um, you know, so maybe if like if you want to just provide any other advice on one off 
Um, yeah, what I'd like to leave you with is a request for anyone who sees this uh, request to you, a request to your audience. This pandemic, this, this coronavirus pandemic is hitting a lot of us hard, but it's hitting some harder than others. And there are many people around the world who are really economically, financially suffering, who had been a part of the tourism industry in these countries before the pandemic started. And they have had nothing for almost a year. Travel is at a standstill. I understand that. And I'm sure they do too. We have to look out for our community's health, but over the course of the next year or two, as this, you know, hopefully fades into history, as this pandemic fades into history, please start traveling again as you can. And please, um, find these local guides and employ their services. They will be in desperate need as will their local uh, tourist economies. They're there for you and they are hurting now, but they, they will want your business back and they'll need it back and they will show you extraordinary corners of the globe. So please, as travel begins again, find locals and, and employ them in your travels. Man, 100% spot on, man. 100% spot on, man. Whew. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show, uh, Neil. And uh, who knows, we can um, ha probably have you again come on in the future. Um, uh, we are planning to have a footprint in Africa, too. We're actually building a house in uh, Inhamban, Mozambique. Yes, nice. Yeah. So, Fantastic. Uh, I'll keep you abreast upon that. Um, now, do you have... Um, any um, uh, Instagram or any social media where they could see some more, more of these uh, outstanding photos that you provided today on the show? Yeah, thanks for asking. Of course, I, I'd welcome you on my, uh, my Instagram page. I'm just Neil Doherty, N-E-I-L. The last name is D-O-U-G-H-E-R-T-Y. I, I have a few hundred photos um, from most of the 97 countries uh, that I visited. Uh, and like I said, I, I, I really like to specialize in street photography, street portraits, and, um, you know, an honest perspective on life in the countries I visit. And so it would be lovely to see you there. And I, I'd love to see your photos as well. Absolutely. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put a, a, a link to your Instagram uh, uh, profile in the description below. And uh, we're going to blast this out to our audience. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a fantastic episode. My guest has been Mr. Neil Doherty with his experiences traveling all over the world. And we just came full circle with a story about family, life, and uh, future. Make sure you follow us on uh, Azamco Global and subscribe to our podcast. Thank you again, Mr. Neil, and I uh, hope to see you again soon. God bless. Shukran, Yusuf. God Off bless, my friend. Okay, man. Take care, brother. Take care.